Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Guess we will do the conference uh, bilingual in German and English, um, provided simultaneous uh, translation, so everybody who is not capable um, to understand or to talk German, please look for the headphones. Um, and now I will take the, the privilege to continue in my mother tongue. Well, we are, we are very pleased that despite this quite exhausting weather, so many of you have come here. It is cooler here, in fact. And it is, of course, a big challenge for our technology and technicians here. We hope that they will stand the test and that we will all survive this day and tomorrow well. It is the 14th annual foreign policy conference of the Heinrich Bell Foundation. So you can talk about a real tradition already. And like in the previous years, we again have a very interesting audience here members of diplomatic representations, scientific institutions, foundations, non-governmental organizations, the German army, the Ministry of Defense. And not least, we also would like to welcome the representatives of the media, that is the journalists. And I would also like to particularly welcome those who have come here because they are interested in our subject because they want to get a better image and more information on a topic which covers a broad range of different subjects and is of utmost importance for future international structures. That is the challenges for peace and security in times of drones, robots and digital warfare. Now, in the beginning, allow me to say that we really regret that representatives of the senior management of the German army canceled their participation on short notice after they had already given their consent to participate. Even though the German army does not have a political mandate, it should not shy away from publicly discussing fundamental issues regarding war and peace. Yesterday, President Obama sketched the future of transatlantic relations in his speech in front of the Brandenburg Gate. However, regarding the criticism of the American drones in Pakistan and Africa, he did not focus on. However, we know his position. It is not a secret. He sketched his position in a fundamental speech on American security and military policy, and he announced that he will have a narrower definition of the use of combat drones. However, he only did that, that from a purely national perspective. From our perspective, this subject needs to be embedded in NATO. We need a transatlantic dialogue with the target to develop common principles, common rules and policies for this new generation of arms and weapons. This demand has also been voiced by think tanks like Brookings. I quote, it's time for a transatlantic accord on drones. It is time for new rules of war, unquote. As a consequence, we are very happy to have a few speakers from the United States here with us. At the beginning of the conference, we would like to take stock of the current situation and ask what potential is in those new technologies, i.e., what are we talking about when we talk about drones, strike robots, and cyber war? The future is already there, said Peter Singer. It is actually the headline of his contribution to international politics. It is a journal 
that you might find outside. You will also find the text on our website, www.bell.de. And we are very happy that he will share his hypotheses with us live in a minute. Allow me to make a few remarks before that. 87 states own unmanned aerial systems already today, i.e. they own drones. 26 of them own bigger systems that are already armed or can be armed. People talk about a revolution in military affairs. People talk about a new era of warfare, which is probably only comparable with the invention of firearms, the mechanization of war, and also the development of the Air Force. Revolutionary technical developments and new forms of warfare have always gone hand in hand. In many cases, the military has been the driving force when it comes to developing new technologies. What we see at the moment is a global trend of digitization of war, unmanned weapon systems, automated remote controls, cyber attacks on other countries. Specific discomfort is triggered by the trend of automation of decision-making processes. Do human beings still make the decision on starting combat actions with all implications, moral, political considerations, or are those decisions increasingly delegated to computers? And what escalation dynamic does this development imply? Once drones are armed, that forces the logic of automation of the war. Soon, the reaction speed that human beings, with which human beings can assess a threat situation will not be enough against the computer speed of a swarm of strike robots. The sheer volume of data that are conveyed by drones exceeds the capability of people to process them. In 2009, the American drone fleet comprised or was 25,000 hours in use or in operation. In 2011, these were already 300,000 hours of operation. At the same time, cameras and sensors were perfectionized more and more. So the amount of information is exponentially increasing. Its assessment can only be managed with computer systems. The debate about arming of robots and drones, the debate about the use and the limits of machine autonomy and its ethic implications has to be led before those alleged, before those systems and situations undermine and erode moral action. There is great reason for concern that those trends will have a destabilizing impact on the international order. The error rate of the use of unmanned weapon systems is obviously not higher than those with conventional weapons that are operated by human beings. However, we have to also see that unmanned aerial systems reduce the threshold to use military violence. It is absolutely legitimate that countries want to reduce the dangers and risks for their own soldiers in armed conflicts. And warfare over longer distances is not a new development either. It is part of a long line from artillery to rocket technology. And morally speaking, there is probably hardly a distance between high-flying bombers that let their fatal freight rain on cities and unmanned aerial systems and drones that look for the targets themselves. The question, however, is... Do those new armed systems foster the militarization of conflicts? And is it still possible to control those conflicts? 
This is also true in a world which is more and more characterized by asymmetric conflicts, where you do no longer have states marching up against other states, but where you have non-governmental actors and players. The rapid development of computer technology and the miniaturization of component parts create a situation where guided weapons become cheaper and cheaper. The problem of proliferation is, of course, at hand. And this is, of course, also true for cyber war. In order to launch a devastating attack on computer systems of another country, you need a lot of know-how, but only little money. Our annual foreign policy conference should, what also wants to shed more light on how to structure that in terms of international law, also when it comes to strike drones and computer attacks. It seems to be totally unclear when we can talk about an attack in the virtual space, that is the cyberspace. And when it comes to international law, what about the American doctrine to have a counterattack with conventional means if there is a cyber attack? Automated weapons systems that look for target themselves, don't they have to be fed back with human responsibility? And who takes legal responsibility if drones or combat robots cause bloodshed in civil society? Some observers have said that cyberspace is the decisive space in which military, political and economic conflicts will be exercised. This is where industry and armament espionage merge with attacks on technological infrastructure. Between China and the United States, this is already a very serious topic. But also the virus attacks on the Iranian nuclear program are part of that whole thing. A specificity of the cyber war is the problem of attribution, that is retraceability and causal attribution of cyber attacks. This does not only undermine the principle of state-state deterrence. The question also is, can you really make governments responsible for cyber attacks that are exercised by civil actors from their territories? Does the transition to cyber war mean that the big slaughtering that characterized the wars of the 19th and 20th centuries belong to the past? Or will virtual and physical forms of warfare merge into a scenario which reminds us of Orwell's 1984? That is an unclear and confusing state of permanent war. It seems to be imperative that, we, that international law needs to be updated. It is absolutely dangerous if new technological possibilities have gray zones of international law emerge, which foster the elimination of borders when it comes to military violence. It is absolutely imperative to clearly establish and determine rules, new rules, in order to stem wars. Everything else would be totally fatal. President Obama announced a new initiative to reduce strategic and tactic nuclear weapons yesterday. That is good. However, arms control also has to cover and consider the new high-tech weapons and arms. This is very difficult to achieve. However, we definitely have to try to achieve it. This conference should not remain a one-off event. We will deal with that topic also in the future, especially with regards to the legal and political definition of those new technologies. To wrap up, I would like to thank all colleagues who organized this conference in terms of its content. Particularly, I would like to thank Gregor Enster our spokesman for foreign and security policy, his colleague Barbara Ashoyer, and thank you also to Melanie Sorge, our freelance project manager. Thank you also to the conference office of the foundation, which is the host of us here in the coming two days. So I wish all of us an interesting conference with a lot of food for thought for future opinion 
information on this interesting issue, especially when it comes to issues of war and peace. We need an informed public and an intensive social debate. And this is exactly what we want to achieve and contribute to, not only with this conference. And now I would like to pass the mic to our moderator, Zilke Tempel, editor-in-chief of Internationale Politik. I would also like to thank you for the wonderful cooperation. And I wish all of us a fruitful and interesting conference. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you very much for coming to this conference. Ralf Fuchs mentioned it already. It is a great pleasure that we have a renowned speaker here who is going to kick off the conference. He is one of the biggest authorities in this area, Peter W. Singer. I mean, we will have a Skype connection today with him. He is a senior fellow. He's everything but a senior, but he is a senior fellow and the director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative at Brookings. Peter Singer, four years ago, wrote a book called Wired for War, which was quite successful if you have a look at New York Times bestseller list. So he made it onto that list with his book which is really a success. It is a fascinating book, not only for tech nerds and those who want to become one. It is really a fascinating list of what has happened already in terms of technological developments and what is exponentially and rapidly going to happen in the future. That might also tell us something about the developments that are possible in those areas, robotics, artificial intelligence. Those are things that are, of course, closely intertwined. And Peter Singer is now working on a project which has nothing to do with a technical book. He works on a novel on cyber war. Maybe you also need a different format so that you can use your imagination in order to realistically sketch what might be possible in the future. Okay, now I hope that we will see Peter Singer and hear him, listen to him. I will keep my mouth shut and afterwards I will pose two or three questions to him. Thank you. Hello, it's, it's great to be able to join you. I wanted to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel there. I understand you have wonderful weather, but uh, we have a family wedding. But it's maybe appropriate to the topic to be able to link with you via technology, the kind of technology that we were only able to imagine back in the days when we watched the Star Trek TV series, and now we have it today that allows me to join you. So what I'd like to do is give you a presentation on some of the key arcs of change when it comes to the 21st century battlefield. And maybe I can ask the organizers if they can put the uh, presentation up on the screen there. Fantastic. So if you can go to the, the next slide. So it's become vogue for leaders, both in politics and in military recently, to argue that one of the lessons of the last decade of war that we've been fighting in places like Iraq and Afghanistan is, as one four-star American general said to me, quote, Technology doesn't matter in the human-centric wars that we fight. But that assumes a definition of technology as something that is exotic and unworkable. To paraphrase the famous musician Brian Eno, technology as a word, technology is the name that we give to things that we don't use every day. Once we use it every day, we stop calling it technology. That is, whether you're talking about a stone or a drone, it's simply a tool that we apply to a task. Next slide, please. So, for example, drones are a technology, so to speak, that went from being something that was once fictional, 
magical. We didn't use it. To now, as uh, was mentioned in the talk before, it's a tool that we use every single day. The U.S. military, for example, went into Afghanistan over a decade ago with a handful of drones, none of them armed. We now have more than 8,000 unmanned aerial systems in the U.S. military inventory, many of them, of course, armed. On the ground, we went in with zero unmanned ground vehicles, ground robotics. We now have more than 12,000 of these technology. And, of course, we're not the only player in the world of robotics now. There is at least 87 other countries out there that are also building, buying, and using drones. And one of them is Germany. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to thinking about this just as a military matter, uh, in formal wars, we've also seen them used in the so-called shadow wars in places that range from Somalia to Yemen. The most notable of these operations is the CIA air war campaign in Pakistan, where more airstrikes have been carried out by drones there than actually uh, in the Kosovo air war. Now, this leads to the next slide that you're seeing here, which is um, another – actually, can you go back? Thank you. Um, which is a change in the locale of where we're fighting. A generation ago, there was an imaginary concept that the writer William Gibson came up with. He described it in this way, quote, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation – a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer. Now, to name this crazy idea of data abstracted, Gibson, a science fiction writer, took the words cybernetics and space and put them together. And that's the first time we got cyberspace. Now, today, the centrality of cyberspace to our entire global pattern of life is just almost impossible to imagine. Everything from our commerce to communication, including the communication that's allowing me to speak to you from thousands of miles away, all depend on this global network of networks. Next slide, please. And, of course, it's also becoming a new mode of warfare and a new domain of warfare. So, for example, the U.S. military not only runs its own supposedly secure uh, version of the Internet, although recent events with the National Security Agency show that's got some problems, but in addition, it accesses the open public Internet over one billion times a day. Over 98% of all U.S. government communications, and this is the same for other governments out there, including Germany, over 98% of these communications run on civilian-owned and operated Internet networks. Next slide, please. But maybe more challenging than thinking about these in terms of the tools themselves in today and tomorrow strategic context is that I would argue is the pace of technologic change. That is, how rapidly technology is moving from being something that is remote and magical into something that's a daily tool. Many of you may be familiar with what this picture shows you, which is Moore's Law, the idea that we have been able to pack more and more computing power into our microchips such that they basically double in their power and capacity about every 18 months or so. Moore's Law has also become uh, something that outlines broader exponential trends in the accelerating returns that we've seen in our technology, how it's constantly multiplying upon itself year after year after year. Next slide. But maybe a better illustration of this is what this picture shows you. It's a picture of a holiday greeting card, one of those little, little cards that you might get on a holiday and you open up and it plays a little song. If you've ever held one of those cards in your hand, you held more computing power than the entire U.S. Army had when my father served in it, and that one single card. And likely after the holidays, you probably threw it away. Now, that's what's happened over the last 40 years. What happens over the next 25 years? Well, if Moore's Law holds true, the way it's held true over the last 40 years, then next slide, please we will see one billion times the amount of change in terms of our technolo technologic capacity. And I mean this with a one and nine zeros behind it. Now, Moore's law doesn't have to hold true. It's not a law of physics. Technology could, maybe it could slow down. What if it slows down as much as one thousandth 
Well, then we'll just see one million times the amount of change over the next 25 years. If you speak to scientists about the worst possible case scenario, the ultimate worst possible case scenario at, for example, DARPA that they project is 10,000 times the change. Now, compare that with our government policy, our laws. Are we keeping up with this amount of change? Next slide, please. So to go back to that notion of drones, it's interesting that both militaries and also ethicists are just now getting comfortable with the concept of drones in terms of being unmanned, remotely piloted technology. But of course, that generation is already becoming outdated, as you see from these pictures here. The first generation of this technology, unmanned, was in many ways like how we thought about the early days of automobiles as being horseless. And we're seeing that even in terms of these pictures show you the forms of robotics going in lots of different directions than being just like the manned platforms that they're replacing, such as how many drones still have the cockpit for the pilot. It's just painted over. Next slide. And of course, if there's not a human involved, you can also get creative in the size of the technology, from teeny tiny systems to large scale systems. Next slide. But maybe more important is the growth in their intelligence and their autonomy. This is a picture of the X-47 UCAS. It's a U.S. Navy uh, system that's just been testing in Maryland. And it's interesting because it's jet powered. It's stealthy. But what's important about it is it's not merely that it is faster or can fly further than the current generation of drones that are used in Afghanistan. It's something that we haven't compared weapon systems in the past. It's smarter. It's more autonomous. It can take off and land on its own, including from the toughest human pilot task or from an aircraft carrier. It can fly mission sets on its own, like air-to-air or fuel on its own. The plan is to be able to penetrate enemy air defenses on its own. The British have a competitive version called the Tyrannus that is going to be able to do target selection on its own. Now, this is not the Terminator. It is not making all of its own decisions. But what we are seeing is a move from describing our technology as the Air Force used to describe as being the human in the loop of decision to now Air Force documents talk about how the human will be on the loop of decision, which is a nice way of saying we are moving out of the loop of decision. Next slide. And so from these changes, we see the user base and the functionality of this technology literally exploded. Basically, they're doing more and more things for more and more users because they are easier to use. Now, the way I think about this is with the computer. When I was growing up, a computer was something exotic. And if you wanted to communicate with your computer, you first had to learn a new language. Uh, For example, I had to learn BASIC if I wanted to communicate with my computer. Now, my four-year-old son can use his computer to pull down the videos that he wants online whenever he wants to watch them. It's not because the computer is simpler. It's because it's so much more advanced. And the same thing is happening with our robotics, where they've gone from requiring pilots to be behind them to fly them to being able to fly them with iPhone apps. Now, what does this mean for war? Well, I'll use my own experience, my unintentional experience in the defense industrial entertainment complex as an illustration. I work as a consultant on a video game called Call of Duty. Uh, If you don't play it, definitely one of the kids that you know play it. And for the game, we tried to conceptualize what a battlefield might look like in the year 2025. And so we came up with the concept of Current technologies like the kind of quadcopters that you can buy at a shopping mall and we uh, arm them, a fictional concept uh, of a quadcopter controllable by a iPhone app that's armed with a submachine gun and explosives. Now, that fictional concept was in the game. We decided to make a TV commercial of the game. And next slide, please. This is the working version that we built called Charlene. We built it for under a thousand U.S. dollars, a quadcopter that's armed with an Uzi style submachine gun and C4 plastic explosives able to be operated with a tablet computer. This is not futuristic. 
It's real. You can pull it online. Over 17 million people have watched the video of Charlene. Now, what's interesting is that among the people who watched it was a Pentagon office who saw this individual there, and they got upset that this crazy Russian, they didn't realize he was an actor that we had hired, they were upset that this crazy Russian had a better drone than the entire U.S. Marine Corps, and of course, better than the entire German Army. And so they decided to try and build it. And now there's a series of defense contractors trying to build what we were able to build for $1,000. And I guarantee you they'll charge more. Next slide. And so what's playing here is the civilianization of this technology of war, where we're seeing the robot move into the domestic airspace, whether it's in Britain, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's in the United States, where it's legislated by our Congress to happen in 2015. And so the drone takes on roles that range from military to police to border patrol to environmental monitoring to farming to even journalism. Uh, to even recreational use, kids recording their own uh, tricks at skiing with these systems. We've seen all of this play out. Next slide. The bottom line here is that the robot is coming. As you can see, it's even coming for Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator himself. This technology is as important as the steam engine, as gunpowder, as the atomic bomb. Next slide. But this technology, as I mentioned, is already here. What's next? I'm part of a project called Next Tech. And what we're trying to figure out is what are those next game-changing technologies? And so as part of it, we did a survey of over 60 scientists from universities, from government organizations like DARPA, from companies like Google and Apple, to uh, venture capitalists, the investors who are putting their money in making the future come true. And essentially, we ask them, what technology today do you think is like the computer in 1980 or like the drone in 2001? It's not science fiction. It's real, but it hasn't yet changed the world. And this is a word cloud of some of the technologies that they told us about. Next slide, please. So some of the most important ones that we found in the war games that we ran were things like artificial intelligence, where we have seen computers already defeat the top humans at everything from chess to TV quiz shows like Watson that you see here that won at Jeopardy. And the idea is that this artificial intelligence will be placed in everything from back-end data analytics. IBM has seen everyone from hospitals to the National Security Agency want to use Watson to go through their data to front-end helping you create smart sensors. Next slide, please. To cyber, but the next generation of cyber, the Internet of Things. Right now, there's roughly 7 billion devices that connect to the Internet. That means most of them have a human behind them. But within five years, we'll see over 40 billion devices connected to the Internet. And that means you won't have humans behind them carrying on conversations like me with all of you. Instead, the devices in the Internet will be talking to each other. The classic idea of this is if you've bought a new car in the last year, it very likely had a technology that linked it back to its manufacturer. So, for example, Mercedes-Benz makes a car that communicates back to Mercedes-Benz when, for example, things like the brake pads need to be replaced. And it automatically makes an appointment for you at the local garage. The next step of this is that your car will communicate back to your house to tell the thermostat in your house whether the heat or the air conditioner needs to be turned on or off when you are coming nearby because your house is linked to a smart power grid. This is all using the internet to make the world run more efficiently to save the environment. Next step. That, of course, though, comes with new kinds of risks and new kinds of warfare. So take that example of the car basically now being a bunch of computers. Well, as a result, we've already seen car hacking where people have been able to remotely operate aspects of a computer in a car contrary to what the owner wants, like being able to turn on and off the engine, pump the brakes, etc. in your car. Next slide. Another new technology that was science fiction just a couple years ago was directed energy, better known as lasers. 
Uh, many of you, for example, may have seen in the news all the excitement in the fall in Israel related to a technology called Iron Dome, where Israel was able to use missiles to shoot down incoming Hamas uh, rockets. It was described as a game changer. When President Obama visited Israel, he even made sure to have a photo opportunity standing next to one of these systems. Well, I hate to tell you, but the idea of using a multi-million dollar missile to shoot down a hundred dollar rocket has already passed. Next slide. This is a picture of Adam, the Area Defense Anti-Munition System. It's a picture of it using a laser to shoot down a missile in flight. It's made by Lockheed Martin. Um, the German company Rheinmetall has its own version. We're already in a world where we're using this technology. A U.S. Navy ship deployed to the Persian Gulf equipped with these kind of systems. Next slide, please. Another fundamental shift in war is not just uh, what we're using – but how we make it. This is better known as direct digital manufacturing or 3D printing, where you turn bits, that is computer designs, into atoms, things. It allows you to manufacture on site, on demand. That's very different than the assembly line process that we've used for the past couple centuries. Next slide. And so what does that mean to war? Well, these two pictures illustrate this for you. One on the top is of the Salsa project. A group of university students in Great Britain thought it would be neat to build a drone, but a better drone than anything used by NATO's militaries, more efficient in its design. And so within their computers, they designed this better drone, and then using a 3D printer, they manufactured it, and then they flew it. It took them one week. Compare that to the design to life cycle of systems like the Joint Strike Fighter that many nations in NATO are buying that's already three decades into development. At the bottom, you have the picture of the U.S. Army's expeditionary lab. It's deployed to Afghanistan, where soldiers there, instead of bringing all their spare parts with them, they manufacture their spare parts within this lab, different parts for different tasks, and they can also redesign them. Now, you can see what we have here is a fundamental shift in not only how we design and manufacture, but also for the companies themselves, their very business model is shifted by these. The big defense manufacturers are very scared of these technologies because it means they're being cut out of the process. Next slide. We're also seeing shifts within ourselves. This is known as human performance modification, where we've seen robotic prosthetics replace what's been lost, but also we're increasingly turning to technology to enhance, to perform better, whether it's chemical technology or physical hardware. Um, much of what's playing out in war is comparable to what we've seen in the Olympics. And indeed, if you go on the um, chat boards for the special operations community, many of them talk about the same techniques used in the Olympics. And so... What does this mean? Well, night vision technology, which is a human performance modification, again, we use it daily, has allowed our forces in places like Afghanistan to operate 24 hours, seven days a week. That gives them roughly three times the combat power as if they didn't have night vision technology. Or think about the mental side of this. What if you had a technology that allowed you to perform at your peak thinking for just 10% longer, or a technology that allowed you to go without sleep for three days, but not be drained by it. All of these are happening right now. Next slide. I've shown you all of these technologies, not to argue that all of them will have the same kind of impact, but simply to make a point. We are at a time of both fundamental political and technologic change. And in many ways, I think the period that we are entering into is a lot like the period around the 1920s, just after World War I. There's a wave of deep strategic questions in terms of the changing global landscape. We also all collectively face tough budget times in our militaries. But finally, we have a series of science fiction-like technologies that are causing huge disruption in not just the tactics of war and the doctrine of war, but the very identity and organization of militaries themselves. Next slide, please. 
And these new technologies, again, that had only recently been science fiction, also provoke deep, deep questions on the law and ethics sides, questions that force us to rethink, for example, from where and how do we carry out attacks and who fundamentally is responsible when things go wrong. Next slide. To redefinitions of the battle space itself, such as how the fictional concept of flying machines, as you see Da Vinci's picture on the top, then created the extension of the battlefield far from where people had previously thought possible, as the picture of uh, scenes like Picasso's Guernica shows you on the bottom. Next slide. And so in closing, that's what makes meetings like this that you're engaged in today so important to better prepare the discourse around all of these arcs of change. And so what is my bottom line advice on all of this? Well, you notice that I talked about the future, but I gave a series of historic parallels. And that's because my sense is the best way for us to succeed is to keep our eyes on both horizons. That is, we should keep one eye towards the horizon in front of us, towards the future, so that we are better able to identify these changes and shape our responses. As Martin Luther King once said, you can't fight history, but you can bend the arc of history in your direction. But we should also keep our other eye on the horizon behind us, on the past, to be able to draw lessons from it. To know, as the great American humorist Mark Twain once said, quote, history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme. Thank you. Where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to be? Peter, can you hear me? The Silk is speaking. Hi. Thank you for this really, really fascinating and also quite unsettling view into the future that is already happening now. Um, it is made more unsettling by me doing it from so far away and, and being a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. Well, which should be a great example. I'd like to challenge you a bit on uh, taking up what you've been saying about um, perspectives, you know, watching the future and trying to gain some insight from history. When you were explaining all this technology, um, I've been thinking, but ever since this war, and that's probably next to prostitution, one of the the oldest activities of mankind. Um, It's been about political goals. It's been about gaining territory. It's been about concepts like deterrence. It's been about crashing the enemy, but not so strongly that you you cannot negotiate with him. Does technology, the way you describe it, really, really change the way we look at war so much um, that in the end you need to have some proper political thinking or we wish to have some proper political thinking behind it, some strategic thinking behind it to make the decisions. What, the, the main question still is not what means do you have but what gains do you want to make, what goals do you have? And that, I hope, has to be pretty much done rather by human beings than by robotics. It's a very good question, and you hit exactly one of the key things here. Uh, While war is changing, or the forces acting on war are changing, there are also fundamental things about war that will always stay the same. Again, whether you're talking about someone using a stone or whether they're using a drone, um, one of them is the causes of war. It's whatever the technology, there are human causes. War will always be caused by our human mistakes, our human greed, our human arrogance. Whatever you want to see as the driver, it is human in nature. Secondly is by its very definition, I believe to be war, there has to be human costs of some kind. And I think that's very important uh, to keep uh, in our minds as uh, wars like, for example, in the U.S., Afghanistan is still going on, but it's very distant from many of us, Um, which, again, technology is something that has enabled that. Another aspect that is uh, always there in war is what Clausewitz called the fog of war. No matter what you intend to happen, the fog of war 
means that it may not always play out that way. Uh, to cite another German, uh, von Molke, you also have the aspect of an adversary in war. No plan that you make will survive first contact with that enemy, a thinking enemy. And again, that applies whether you're talking about using stones or whether you're using rifles or whether you're using drones in cyber warfare. Uh, the, some of the unintended things that happened with Stuxnet is a great illustration of that. The shift that we're seeing is something, again, it's a story of history, whether it was the shift from how if we were fighting with a stone in my hand to then suddenly I get the sling, that means, for example, who can do what in war is shifted. David can be more lethal than Goliath. And that's the same phenomena of, for example, the requirements that uh, the physical requirements that we needed to carry out a bombing raid. Once you needed to be a pilot inside the systems and the physical requirement that went on to that, the top of the organization to now you can be sitting in Nevada and you can be an untrained uh, pilot. Uh, you don't have to be an officer. One of the top um Drone pilots in the U.S. military, for example, is a high school dropout who's in the army, who's not an officer. And yet you can be just as effective. So the who is shifting. And cyber warfare takes us to whole new levels because do you even have to be in the military, um, et, et cetera? Uh, the second shift is just like with airplanes, the where of war is fundamentally shifted. So I think cyberspace is a good illustration of that where literally we're fighting in a location that didn't exist before. And this turns to the last point, which is the laws. There are fundamental values in war that are unchanging, fundamental legal values that we want, uh, accountability and discretion. But new technologies open new challenges for these values, such as I think autonomous robotics raises deep questions about how do you hold someone responsible when their role in the decision might have been years earlier. In many ways, what we're seeing in war is the kind of questions that were originally asked in the science fiction novel Frankenstein. Does the designer bear responsibility for what happens with their technology when it does something that they didn't plan for? Thank you. That's exactly what we are trying to explore over the next two days. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. And I thank you for having me. Nice celebrations then <laughs> for you. Bye. So.